Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, listeners all over the world, welcome back to another edition of the Anything Wrestling Podcast AWP. Thank you so much for joining us. We are back here today with another episode reviewing SummerSlam 2021. Today, unfortunately, it is not a triple threat. It is a straight up one on one match. It is myself, the Shant, and Dan, the man. Dan, how you doing? I'm doing great, brother. <laughs> um, but we're here today to talk about <laughs> SummerSlam. Uh, SummerSlam, the uh, uh, biggest disappointment of the summer. <laughs> Uh, which I can tell you, the uh, commish, our uh, missing wheel here, the missing wheel of the tricycle, um, was not shy to share with us. And I won't be either because I have a lot of sentiments that I want to get off my chest. As I told you guys, I have a lot of steam that I want to let out. So this was... You could propel a train with the steam this man's about to release. For sure, we will be able to... um, But before we get into the event itself, I want to quickly bring this up. I actually want to make it a footnote because uh, it is worth noting that after a seven-year hiatus, CM Punk has finally made his debut in AEW. And why do I bring this up, even though it's a completely different company, is because I felt like going into SummerSlam, CM Punk debuted, I want to say, 48 hours before the event. More or less. More or less. So I felt like you had 48 hours to make SummerSlam not necessarily the thing to counteract CM Punk's debut, but to make sure that you are providing the best show that you can possibly put on. To steal the headlines for the right reasons. For the versus, right reasons. Versus yeah. what we got. And I agree because how many times have we heard the the stories? And I feel like it's it's like two three times a month that Vince just decided to shred the script for Raw or SmackDown day of. Like, well, you couldn't do that here. You couldn't rework it here. Granted, I guess this is this does have a very reactionary feel to it from top to bottom, uh, especially the, the middle and the bottom. But uh, yeah. It, wasn't the best show it just it just wasn't at all so i mean would you like to to jump right in or let's you... let's let's do so let's jump right in all right well, um, let, let, let's start off real quick just with a mention of it biggie defeats baron corbin by pinfall in a singles match obviously there was the story going on with baron corbin stealing, stealing. the money in the bank briefcase biggie the rightful money in the bank winner. I would say... Uh, I I would move on from this. Yeah. I don't know exactly what the game plan is. I read that there seems to be some sort of plot twist in the works for Baron Corbin, and they really like him in the company. But... Well, it's a weird story. To quickly touch on it for one second, because I know they're doing the whole thing where Corbin lost his crown and yeah. he's flat broke and whatever. I thought if you can book it the right way, it would be interesting if Baron Corbin grabs the briefcase, cashes in. Yeah. And I mean, you can go anyway, anywhere with that. Like, yeah. oh, well, he wasn't the official contract holder, so you can't really count it. And it's like you can kind of book from there. Um but yeah, I mean, it's a shame because I feel like if Big E is your contract holder, you should be building him up. I, I kind of, I thought about this earlier today. The the Money in the Bank contract should be what the Intercontinental title was back in the 90s yeah. where they would give it to you like, hey, can you sell some tickets? Can you get some eyeballs on the product? And usually your Shawn Michaels, your Austins, your Rocks, your Bret Hart's would usually get that title first before they and would that, get the and WWE. That would be the stepping exactly. Step. So I feel like this contract should function. That should way. function. But actually in recent years it's been the opposite. Well they where they will job you out, but it's okay because you're gonna cash in and you're gonna get that, that victory. Yeah, but they don't establish you leading up to it and so then when you ultimately cash in you're not actually a credible contender. Exactly. And yeah, that's like Maybe this is them them trying to build two guys at once, which we've seen over the last, I don't know, decade. They're not good at doing. Um, but having Baron... like It's a weird story in the first place. But the, the other flip side of that is that, okay, if they had the game plan of him stealing the briefcase and doing what you said, cashing in on somebody, and then, well, that's not right. 
Well... Which is controversial, which is what Vince McMahon likes. Now, you imagine all the reports you would get, like, Baron Corbin wins the title even though he's not the official money in the bank holder. Yeah, but the problem is they put too much stock as of late into both of their world champions that they can't do that right now. But if you're going that route, there should be a, a, a an immediate payoff on it. Like, yeah. it should happen... Like, it should have either happened at SummerSlam or it should have happened, like... Within the next the next month, but I just I think they put too much stock in Bobby and Roman right now to do something like, like that. Like that, yeah. So yeah, I personally haven't seen this match. Um, again, I'm hoping that Big E gets what he rightfully deserves, and that's this long, extensive push with the title, a credible push, even if it's without the title. But I just feel like at this moment, back to your point, I, I, I don't think we're getting that. And we're probably not going to get that because yeah. you have so much centered around Roman and Lashley as your champions. So with that, let's move on to the first official match on the card. And as we go, we will jump over and impart some of the wisdom that the commish has uh, shared with us. Yes. Uh, so that he is here in spirit. In spirit. Uh, but let's get it going, bro. Please don't. Um, so first match here, we have the team of Randy Orton and Riddle, also known as RK Bro, which, by the way, that's not three letters, um, defeating AJ Styles and Omos for the Tag Team Championship. Raw Tag Team Championship. The Raw Tag Team Championship. So let's let's go ahead and take a look at the commission's notes on this one. Uh he basically said everything at SummerSlam went more or less the way that I was predicting or expecting it to, uh, including that the newly reformed alliance of RK Bro would succeed. That's pretty much all he said about that. About match. this particular match. Now, obviously, as of late, you had that long-standing thing where Randy was missing, and then he came back, and there was the are they are they friends are they not? Oh, we hit him with the RKO. And then you had AJ and Omos. And I just, I, I don't think that AJ and Omos are uh, necessary as a tag team right now, personally. I So I think going with RK Bro might be the way to go right now. The thing with me is I'm not really vibing with either team right now. <laughs> team, quote unquote. Um, this whole, like, Matt Riddle and Randy Orton thing, it's kind of weird because one second we're a team. Then one second he, one guy betrays the other. Then one second, oh, you came to my rescue, so I guess we are a team and I, I, and I can respect that. It's got, like, a weird buddy cop vibe to it. Yeah. Where you've got, like, Riddle, who's, like, the quirky, uh, weird cop and Randy is the real straight-laced guy. yeah. And he doesn't like the guy at first, but he kind of comes around Rose, to it. yeah. Or, like, you could draw even draw the compare. Do you ever see Central Intelligence? Yes. With, with, with the, ro- the Rockin, yeah. Uh, Riddle is the Rockin <laughs> situation. And Randy is playing Kevin Hart, which is a weird dynamic. That is a weird dynamic. Um, I still, I'm not, so, I'm not solo on Riddle. I think the character is whack. Me too, if we're being honest. But um, I can't take anything away from him from a general performing standpoint. Like, he, he's fine. And then you got Randy, who's always reliable, and AJ, and o- almost, I, I ha- almost I haven't seen anything that blows me away. He's a big guy, and he chokeslams people. Who, where have we seen that up? thousand times before you can catch the great collie on peacock for only 9.99 um i thought we said it's just cheaper than that whatever not the point go on i think it's if you get premium it's, <laughs> which is what i'm paying so it's 9.99 all right um here's the thing is dan you brought this up a while back where you said they released braun Strowman because vince now is, thinks that almost is his new giant yeah. who's gonna be well established and is gonna take over and can be trusted the problem is Yes, at WrestleMania, we saw a dominating performance, yeah. which is exactly what it needed to be. But since then, it it's more comedic, if anything. Like, he got beat up with a scooter, like, the yeah. night after, and it's like, okay. Yeah. And, and I like, that. that's kind of the slapstick nature of what they've been doing with AJ as of late. So, almost is suffering by proxy, even. Yeah. But, he, I mean, like I said, I haven't been impressed by what he's done 
Because I think he's just sort of a big dude who's there to be a big dude. And he doesn't have the same charisma as somebody like Kane, The Undertaker, or Braun. Braun, yeah. So I'm just not, I'm not, I'm not sold on Yeah, that. I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm not vibing with either team, like I said. Uh, okay, RK Bro got the victory, they're the champs right now. To be very honest, I don't see this going on for very, very long. I, not. I can, I can easily see Riddle getting pinned for the next, you know, title match. And then Randy Orton being like, okay, it was fun while it lasted. RKO, I'm out, on to the next venture. I feel like they do have to get at least one successful defense in. Which is what they happens. do. That's the traditional thing to do. Yeah. But yeah, in this situation, I think it lends itself to it where you go, oh, okay, look, look at this. And then you over the next four weeks leading up to the next match, you go, you build it up and Randy's like, all right, okay, cool. I get, I, I'm coming. Up. We might even see Randy flicker a little bit into a more Riddle-esque mindset here and there where he like starts to like, relax and then he goes what am I doing and he snaps out of it he hits Riddle with the RKO after they lose the belts and then we do a, a singles feud with partner the versus partner yeah. former tag team partners yeah. at it tale as old as time yeah so as an opener okay it was there I I personally thought to kind of get the SummerSlam vibe going I would have loved to see an RKO on, on Omos because yeah. I, I felt like that it's we haven't seen it yeah. and that would have been like a good spot for the good, first yeah. match like okay here we go we're off oh look what Randy did yeah right. no that would have been good because I think they kind of teased an RKO at one point that raw didn't and they didn't, they didn't pull the trigger so. yeah so so uh, I, I, I guess final thoughts on this one anything I hate to say it I could have done without it let, 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 so even though there may be some things that we haven't necessarily seen let's give each of these like a quality rating okay. as far as like the story um, this one I'd probably give it like a B minus okay okay I'll, I'll, I'll go with that I'll, I'll give it a B minus as well they're, okay. they're, they're trying I get it like Randy at this point is your De- is your dependable guy yeah like we need someone we need someone to be partnered with someone randy get over here we need you so i feel you a- aj kind of the same thing too because he's won the title he's been at mania he's had all these moments so yeah but moving on let's step into um alexa's playground yeah so it's uh, ray white i mean alexa <laughs> sorry so we got alexa bliss accompanied by lily <laughs> defeating Eva Marie, who had Dewdrop, uh, beats her with I don't know what the what's the, the DDT move called. Now that she's not doing the twisted the twisted, uh, yeah, Sister um, Abigail part of it. I I I I know there's a name for it. I just don't. It's know what, what it is. it's what it is. Anyway, point is Alexa Bliss beats Eva Marie. Dewdrop doesn't care. Eva Marie and Dewdrop finally splitting off. Dewdrop keeping the name. <clears throat> Kamish sent in his thoughts. Uh, Alexa Bliss defeated Eva Marie, because let's be real, it's Eva Marie. And I think that more or less encompasses the, the entire thing. The Lily Lucian. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna go I'm gonna go off with some thoughts on this one. Please. First of all, as much as I love Alexa, I've been cooling on her since WrestleMania since because WrestleMania. they they set something up that could have been cool and have not done anything with it. Like they kind of in her entrance they kind of tease it she still got like the the dark uh like makeup dripping down her face. But we haven't seen anything about Alexa coming out of that box and just looking like a demon. Yeah. Nothing. They didn't explain it. Lily doesn't explain it. Um, and she's just got this doll that now is just a merchandising opportunity, which I'm going to tie in real quick. Somebody, I don't remember who it was. I think it might have just been a generic ass report. But I think it was an insider said, in reference to Karrion Cross's new mask, he wore it during his entrance from Raw. Oh. He looks sort of like a weird, weird samurai guy. They slapped a mask on him. That everything needs to be marketable. And I think that's exactly why Lily exists. Because she's weird and quirky and people like weird. I think that's really the point of, of Lily. 
is to to sell dolls. But then you've got Eva, mm-hmm. who's not a good performer. She never has been. And she's been gone for a long time. And I can't imagine she came back and started working with uh, with a Brian Kendrick or somebody to really get in, get back in ring shape. And Piper Nivens, uh, Dewdrop, is not getting to do anything of ma- of merit. This has been flat. This entire thing, specifically the Eva Marie side of it, has been flat since she came back. Did I read somewhere where it said they don't? They didn't even have plans for the whole evolution and what they were gonna do for her. And not surprised. Uh, but the fact of the matter is now we got Alexa Bliss and Lily. Mm-hmm. Coming out to say hello to uh, who we'll talk about later. Mm. I don't care. Care. I would rather like at this point if they're if they're not gonna actually invest any time or energy into a good quality payoff for this character or a good quality story for this character as opposed to just I'm still here with my possessed doll. <laughs> then I don't care. Just turn her back into Alexa Bliss because it's a waste of time. And this, hmm, what are you about to do? Break out into song? No, she's just, you can't see me, but I'm doing the little, like, spirit fingers thing Alexa's been doing as she takes over people's minds. I don't, uh, Speaking of you can't see me. Knock it off. Um, Go. I, I will quickly <laughs> jump in here. Um... You're absolutely right. I've said this before that with WWE, they either let something drag on for too long or they pull the trigger way too early. It's never just right. And I feel like with Alexa, you're right. That's exactly what's going on. Up until Mania, we had this intriguing story with all three of them, with Randy and Bray and her. But since then, it's just, okay. And I mean, we, we, we joke about it, but they essentially gave the Bray Wyatt character to her Gave Bray Wyatt the boot and said, "Okay, it's a, it's yours now, Alexa." And we, action, but we don't know what to do with it, which is the problem. Yeah, Bray, at least when he when he was in the in the the driver's seat, had like had direction, had a goal in mind, even if sometimes it was stupid stuff like uh, fifteen hundred s- curb stomps and a sledgehammer, and we're gonna we're gonna end the match by stoppage. Which we kind of got later on in the night, but continue. At least there was, like, a, a goal. There was an end game. Yeah. But or if with, there wasn't, he would somehow salvage it. He, yeah. He would somehow get something out of it. But you got Alexa, who is really there to... Bless her. Kind of Bless just her. do what she's told to do at this point. And they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what to do with this character. All they got is the doll. And there was the article I sent you guys that I, like, jokingly, kind of tongue-in-cheek said, they're going to put the the belt on Lily, aren't they? (laughs) Like, imagine. That seems like some shit that that Vince would pull. Where we would, one, where you'd have Lily and, like, just another damn merchandising opportunity. Where she, they come out with another Lily and she's got the little women's title on her. It's just like a stitched on felt belt. Yeah. And now you've got that that you can sell too. What a waste. Ladies and gentlemen, catch WrestleMania 38 Lily versus the mop. Um, also, you can quote me that if that uh, happens, I predicted that. So let's give this this one uh, its, its letter grade. Yeah. I'm going to give Bliss and Eva Marie's feud a D. I'll give it a D. I'll give it a C because with Alexa, at least you sort of kind of have something with the character, even though you're not taking it anywhere. I like do drop. She's very reliable if you book her the right way. Eva Marie is beyond the point. Um, so I, I give the whole assembly a C. That's fair. But stepping away from Alexa, I mean, even Eva Marie, it's like, I, I tell you guys all the time, apparently they had no room for Ruby Riot, they had no room for Braun, they had no room for Al- Alistair Black, no room for Bray Wyatt, but they have room for Eva Marie when they brought her back. And somebody who they're going to rebrand as Dewdrop. Which, by the way, I've seen her in the Mae Young Classic, phenomenal performer. Yeah. I mean, you could build to Dewdrop do versus Nia Jax. Easily. Yeah. 
or a Dewdrop versus a Rhea Ripley. Yeah, and they, they at least finally have somebody that they can they can go against because for a long time you would look at Nia fighting some of these girls and go, this isn't even believable. Like, it's not even fair. Like Alexa versus Nia, I don't I don't realistically believe Alexa would ever beat her. I don't. Because even her hitting a drop kick to Nia's knee, she weighs what? 80 pounds soaking wet? <laughs> she, like, she's, a, she's tiny. She's an itty-bitty yeah. girl. And she's hitting drop kicks on this... I don't know. What is she, 200? I don't, I don't want to say it out loud. Because if I'm wildly off, it's going to sound like a dick. Yeah. But she's, she's not small. Yeah. And to have her against these Barbie dolls... It it's not realistic. She's you, your giant in the women's division. Yeah, she's your you know exactly. So you put her up against somebody like Piper, who's a similar size, or you can get away with Rhea because Rhea's a, a a tall specimen. Shayna. Yeah, Shayna, who's a believable Powerhouse. fighter. Yeah, but yeah, some of the like an Eva, I do drop should crush her. Yeah, literally, literally and figuratively should crush her. And that story should end. Let's go to the commission's notes. <laughs> the greatest robbery of the entire event came when we were all denied what could have been the greatest match in all SummerSlam history. Sheamus versus Sheamus for the United States Championship. Now let me cut, cut in here Please. and give just a little bit of backstory. When we were messaging back and forth about the event as new stuff was coming out. One of the dirt sheets, I can't remember which one, I would go to, and for whatever reason, under the card, they would say, like, Roman Reigns versus John Cena, Bobby Lashley versus Goldberg, Sheamus versus Sheamus. And I went, why? Who's not proofreading? Why aren't you (laughs) proofreading your articles? But that's the point here. So now you guys are caught up. Why, WWE? Why? All inside jokes aside, I know it was meant to be Damian Priest versus Sheamus, but this event was a joke, and I'm sure Sean would agree. Either way, I wasn't invested in this, but I hope to see more of Damian Priest like we got to see in NXT. So, if it isn't obvious yet, we are talking about the fourth match on the card, Damian Priest versus Sheamus for the United States Championship. Damian Priest wins, becoming your United States Champion. Um... Another victim of being called up to the main roster had your 15 seconds of fame with the whole Bad Bunny thing that was Wait, going which on. I gave zero mm-hmm. cares about. Me too. <laughs> um, and now at this point, it's just salvaging whatever you can with any championship that's not one of the main championships. Well, on the flip side, like I, the, the sh- I think these two were going at it for a minute, weren't they? Isn't Damien the reason that Sheamus was wearing the mask? Yeah. So, I mean, hopefully that buries this now, and Sheamus can move on to something. Hopefully not Drew McIntyre, but we saw what happened on Raw. Um, but Damien, I think, I has been one of the, the like bright spots in their, in their minds over there on Creative for a minute, and they just haven't actually executed anything. So this is the, the first step in them trying to push him now. So we'll see. We'll see. You Like, the problem with... WWE. One of the problems with WWE is that a lot of times with their main event, because they haven't ever built up their squad, which we can beat to death. Yeah. You, you go back to the Attitude Era. You could. You could. Uh, it was like a claw machine of talent. It would go down. <sighs> okay. Cool. We got Jericho versus Triple H, or <sighs> oh, The Rock versus Kurt Angle, and they would. They were always solid. Yeah. Solid stories. But nowadays, like, what do we got? We got Roman and John. We had to bring John in for this. Bobby and Goldberg. We had to bring Goldberg in. Honestly, for, this. for a second, when you just look at this card and you look at like your staples, your pillars in this business, for right now in twenty twenty one, I see Roman, I see Lashley and Drew. That's kind of it. I mean, for for the guys, yeah. for the guys, uh, for the women. I mean, there's Becky, obviously. Bianca is slowly and making even, her way. Even having Randy up there with Riddle, eh, 
Randy's established. I mean, he he's goes, established, he, but yeah. you can take him or leave him. They yeah. went without him for three, three or four weeks. I mean, like full time contenders, kind yeah. of like how The Rock and Austin and Triple yeah. H were. It's like other than they that, don't have I have anyone. I really don't see anybody, and that's the problem. <laughs> and it's not there. I mean, Seth, Seth. I have to put him in there, even though he's kind of drops in and out of like the main event limelight. Um, it's not their fault. I want to emphasize that it's not the performers' fault. Um, but it's just, they don't do a good job of, like, building up their, their main event, yeah. you know, roster, so. But, so, you've got, you've got a pay-per-view where you bring in Goldberg and John Cena to be your world championship challengers, while you've got guys like Damian Priest, like Sheamus, like Drew, like Jinder, Seth, Edge, who are just sitting there, and you've given no attention to, so we don't... Like, there's a couple of them, like you said, that we could hypothetically have plugged in. Like, hell, you could have just swapped some stuff. You could have done Roman versus Seth. You could have slid Edge over, had Edge do... Have Edge go against Bobby Lashley. And we would have been just as good. It would have been just, just as good. Big E could have cashed in at SummerSlam and taken a jab. Instead of bringing in the part-timers, which I don't want to crap on them, on the, the guys... But you don't need them. Yeah. You don't need them. You should be putting in the effort to build your other people because you're... Like, Bobby is get probably getting close to the end of his career. Edge is really only back as long as he feels good. Goldberg is 50 years old. John Cena is one foot out the door at this yeah. point. And so it's... And even Rand, Randy's going to wind down eventually where he shifts to being a producer or something. Yeah. You need this to, to, to build more people because you're going to, you're going to, the well is going to run dry. Yeah. And they are not refilling it. Not to point out any specific names because we're not there yet. After the last match, they brought back somebody. And yeah. my initial reaction was, oh, great. Another way of not pushing your current talent yeah. but bring in somebody back. And yeah. giving them the, the yeah. spotlight. And the only thing I'll say about that is that you can argue that it's the opposite of what we've seen before, so it may play differently, but it's still the lazy writer's way out. Yeah. Well, what do we, what, what do we have that's tried and true? This. As opposed to... For the 80th time. As opposed to developing somebody. Like, the Usos, for example... Which we'll, we can shift to here in just yeah. a second. Uh, but the Usos, they were kind of building them up. And as far as I'm aware, that they've kind of petered out. Like, they're not even really connected to him right now, are they? Well, because I know one of the Usos was like, oh, no, Roman, I'm not your, for lack of a better word, your servant. Yeah. Jim. Um. But then all of a sudden, oh, no, we're on the same page and we win the tag team championships. Yeah. Like, okay. Anyway, let's so now let's give Damian Priest and Sheamus their their letter grade then. So I I would give this one this feud pro, I'd probably give them. Uh, I'm probably gonna go B minus on this one too. I'm gonna go C. Um, Sheamus, I feel like again I brought it up earlier. You used stuff like the United States Championship, the IC title, to keep people like them afloat. Yeah. And then once they don't have that belt anymore, they sink all the way down. Yeah. Damien Priest, I really haven't seen anything where I'm like, yeah, okay, I can root for this guy. Not yeah. because he's a bad performer, but first the spotlight was on Bad Bunny, and then now it's like, okay. Well, Damien's also, in my opinion, kind of a flat character. Like, I just don't think the dude's got a ton of charisma to him. Yeah. So I'm not blown away by him as, a, as an overall performer. So I, eh, it yeah. is what it is. I'm fine. I'm fine if we move past this feud at this point. Yeah. So. But speaking of the Usos. Yes. Next, next up, we had the Usos retaining the WWE SmackDown Tag Team Championship over the Mysterios, Ray and Dominic. Going back to the commission's thoughts, we got the Usos retained, which could which could cause friction between Ray and Dominic. So maybe we can get a father versus son angle out of them. I'm not against the idea of that. I actually thought Dominic was going to turn the night of. Yeah. Because, you know, at SummerSlam, there's usually a face turn or a heel turn or a return or a go away. And I thought that would be interesting if Dominic betrays his father and 
you go to the father versus son thing. Now, here's the counterpoint. Is Dominic ready to stand on his own? That's the thing. Because once you split him from Ray, once you take him out of the tag team picture, he's either going to get lost in the shuffle or you've got to push him toward something. Like maybe, what what show are they? Smackdown? Yeah. Uh, which mid-card belt is over there? I think it's IC. Yeah, the Intercontinental Championship. Okay. So, you'd have to push him toward, like, an IC feud if you're going to take him out of it. Like, it would have to be him versus Ray, finish that, move on to a mid-card. But, I don't know if I take him seriously as a singles competitor yet. But maybe, maybe by working with his father... Ray can give him the grit and the edge that he's going to need to stand on his own two feet. Yeah. So who knows? As for the Usos, Usos, I don't care. (laughs) Sorry, Jimmy and Jay. Love how you Um, started off so enthusiastic and then just... (laughs) Yeah, no, I, uh, like, like, well, like I said, I, I feel like they've more or less separated the two, like, the Roman and the Usos for now. But are we going to do that every time, or are, are they a stable or not? Are they a stable or not? Well, in fairness... Decide. <laughs> right before the... When Roman was making his entrance, the Usos came out and Roman did the, I got this, I got this, let me do this alone tonight. I just feel like they're a lazy few, a, a lazy faction now. Because it seems sort of fair weather, like oh, good, good, good. did but they didn't they didn't run in, did they? No. Not to say that they need to, but that's for the what you do. Time. That's what you do with a heel faction. Um, but but they see, also that's I the don't thing. think they really did a bunch with them backstage to establish that they're still connected. Like all I, they they could have easily gotten away with a backstage segment instead of the on the stage thing. Te- like wrestling, I think is a little different than s- than your typical uh, storytelling. Yeah. You always hear show don't tell. I feel like you got to do a little bit more telling when it comes to this story because the wrestling match is the showing. Yeah. And so they should have had, in my opinion, a backstage segment where the Usos straight up come up. They're they're happy. They've got their belts. They're hyped. They're like, all right, man. Let's go, Roman. Let's yeah. go out there and, and crush this one, too. And that's when Roman says, I got it. Yeah. I don't need you guys out there tonight. I'm going to put John down myself. I'm going to prove I'm the head of the table. Um, and that would have that would have sold me more on them being attached to each other. But I, I, I just think they're kind of lazy sometimes yeah. with keeping stuff keeping stuff fresh and alive. Fresh is a big one because I feel like, honestly, we really haven't got... I mean, I'm going to go back to it again. I'm going to allude to it before we get into it later. The ending of Cena and Roman. It's like, here we go again. We're doing it all over again. It seems like we were doing it two years ago and then before that, two years before that. And it's like, it's this never-ending cycle of, oh, because a face and a heel have switched places... It's a new idea. It's like, no, it's not. Because we're in the era of bleeding over into anti-heroes and it's not clearly distinguished if you're a face or a heel. Well, and John even even teased Roman about it. He said four or five WrestleMania main events. Well, two or three of them were with that guy. (laughs) So what have we been doing? Yeah. Recycling. Yeah. So let's give it a rating. Uh, Usos defeating the Mysterios. B. I will give it a B minus. Yes. Okay. I Mysterio and Dominic and Ray, they've been floating in the tag team thing, and then Usos. At we were talking about staples earlier in tag team. One of your staples has to be the Usos in this day and age. Yeah. So. I'll give it a B minus. Um, but speaking of the letter B. Oh God. We got a lot of B's up in this We got match. a lot to talk about right now. So, was this my was this my match or your match to, to lead into? You go ahead. It's your girl, and even though I have words about your girl, you go ahead. Okay, so let's lead into this. Originally, it was intended to be Bianca Belair defending the SmackDown Women's Championship against Sasha Banks. And we got advertisements, we got teases, we got pitches for this match all the way up to the day of. Yeah. We had 
an advertisement for Sasha as the opponent until the match was coming on. And then, and this part, like, this part I rolled my eyes at because I didn't know what was about to happen either, but I did did not want to see it again. And I don't think you wanted to. For the 89th time? No, I'm good. But they announced Sasha Banks is not uh, able to compete. Uh, Bianca Belair's new opponent is and Carmella's theme plays and Carmella comes out and you're sitting there going why? Dan. Why? And she comes out and the match is about to start and they do the, they raise the belt the and belt. then oh man the pop as Celtic Invasion hits. And Becky Lynch makes her that's the name of her theme song. Was wasn't that Seamus's? No, I don't know. I don't know what his his theme's called, but I got I got her theme on my phone. I know what it's called. And so her theme hits. Dan, it's all right. They all lived happily ever after, except Bianca. Continue. So <laughs> Becky's theme hits, and the crowd erupts, and she comes out, and she looks great, and I'm hyped. I'm ready. And she comes out, and she gets in the ring, and she I think she talks for a second. Then she knocks Carmella out. I think it was reversed. I think she Either disposes way. Carmella, grabs she, the mic. Yeah, she's there. Carmella gets knocked out. Becky takes her place. Um, they decide to do that match. And Bianca's bouncing up and down. She's excited. She's like, yeah, I would much rather fight a new opponent than <laughs> Carmella. And you get the moment where they circle up. And Becky, for whatever reason, grabs the microphone and says, What do you say, the the man and Bianca Belair blow the roof off this place? Which is a weird... It's a weird anti-climax for this match. Because then the crowd pops. Bianca's nodding her head. And then Becky offers the handshake. And as Bianca reaches in for the handshake... Becky just cold cocks her, boom, right in the face, and then hits her with the Beck bottom. Whatever this, yeah, whatever this move move actually would be called outside of the the manhandle slam. Dumb name. Anyway, yeah. pins her in. I guess the match. Twenty six minutes. Twenty six. Twenty six seconds. Six seconds. Sorry, not minutes. That would have been a classic. No. <laughs> And Becky walks out SmackDown Women's Champion. Now, let's flip the screen and uh, dive into this one real quick. Uh, luckily, it's still pretty concise. The, the man returns to take away the SmackDown Women's Championship from Bianca. For what? A horrible squash and disgracing the SmackDown belt? Becky trying to come back as a heel? Becky and Bianca pulling off a double turn? So the the commish offers up a handful of questions there, which we can we can address in in, in their own right. But uh, everything we've heard, everything I've heard, seems to be pointing to this is now a heel Becky Lynch that we're getting. And what culture themselves has talked about this a little bit, and I think that they are right. I think WWE is playing a, a dangerous game, whether it was Becky or Vince who decided this. Because we don't, after nine, or uh, after, what, 11 months? Yeah. Almost, a, yeah. almost a year? A year, yeah. Um, we don't want to boo her now that she's back. Yeah. I love Becky. I want to watch her have solid matches with Bianca. And other people um but to bring her back and have her be like a straight up heel i don't think i don't think it's gonna stick because i think that even putting her against faces isn't it's not gonna do anybody any favors you put her against a bianca and either she's getting cheered or bianca's getting buried one of two things is going to happen there. Both happened at SummerSlam, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. So, we'll see. Like, we'll see. I'm not optimistic on the longevity of this attempt. 
I think that they should have brought her back as a face, and if they wanted to do the convert convert later, they should have built they should have built a story that ended with that. But let me jump in here for just one second. I'm gonna go back to the footnote that I brought up at the very beginning of recording, which was forty eight hours before this event. One of the biggest superstars in the history of the business, of the wrestling business, made his debut in AEW. And this show was essentially your opportunity to get the headlines on your show. Here's the thing, is I feel like this whole segment was improperly handled. Because I looked at it and I said, okay, let's just say for a split second, you bring Carmella out. Bianca and Carmella have a 10 to 12 minute solid match. Okay, Bianca retains. Okay, everything is good. All right, this is the cards that were dealt because Sasha couldn't compete for whatever reason. So Bianca and Carmella, they try. They give you a 10 to 12 minute, you know, match. And then you have Becky Lynch come out because at that point you establish that, okay, it's SummerSlam, so we need we need a big pop, we need a big moment. So Becky Lynch comes out and establishes, I'm here, okay, you reached the pinnacle, you're the women's champion, you've defeated everyone that there is to defeat, now I'm back. And at that point, you don't even have to have her to do the back bottom, you don't need to have her to sucker punch or anything, you just have the standoff in the ring. And she can say something as simple as, the man is back. And she wants her championship back. That's it. Period. End of story. You have the stare down. And you go into the new season, essentially, of your program. But in this segment, Carmella gets buried even more. After seven months of buildup, you have completely buried Bianca, who you plucked out of obscurity. Because she was on your roster from last year's Mania all the way to the Rumble. And you did nothing with her. So you pluck her out of obscurity. You give her the push, you give her the main event, you give her the championship, you have her go through everybody, only to lose it in 26 seconds. Yeah. And in not in convincing fashion. Like, your girl has got some good moves, but the back bottom doesn't convince me as, okay, oh, she did it. And a lot of people, and I, like, I hate, <laughs> I hate the fact that this was even a thing, a lot of people compared it to when Kofi Kingston yeah. lost to Brock in nine seconds after uh, like seven months of buildup so now i don't have a problem with the move like if that's a new move in her repertoire as a finisher okay i've i've talked before about uh impact finishers and how i do think everybody should have one yeah um but yeah this was weird now so i, I here here's my thought Kind of going off what Kamish suggested about a double turn. I think that a more natural way to do what I said and what he said, um, and potentially land back where we are, would have been that maybe you have Bianca beat Carmella in, in convincing fashion, mm -hmm. and you have her now, she flips. She's a heel for the moment. And you just have her get real, like, cocky. Yeah. And you say, I've beaten this girl ten times. I want, I want a real challenge. I want to move on. I'm tired of this. And now she's arrogant. She's cocky. She, she, she's hungry. And that's when you hit with Celtic Invasion. And Becky comes out. And now you've got this program. Yeah. And you've got Face Becky going, I'm back. How about you take me on? And then we can build to like the next pay-per-view where maybe we do the switch there, we do the double turn that he's referring to, where now you bring Bianca back, you ha you ultimately make her sympathetic because you kind of, like, you don't do a 26 second match, but you have Becky win using some sort of dirty tactic. And you might have been able to get away with it then. Because yeah. then, at that point, people are like, did Becky just bury Bianca? But with more actual emotional investment in it. Yeah. This, underwhelming. Even if this is to try and elevate Bianca now by saying, great, now she's got this big bat, this um, big boss uh, in front of her, this final boss in front of her in the form of Becky Lynch. Yeah. You, 
You just had her lose in 26 seconds to a punch and a body slam. And that was enough to keep down your 57-minute Royal Rumble SmackDown Women's Championship win, Bianca Belair. It's not a, not a good look. And this is what we always talk about. They're not good at pulling the trigger when they need to. And they're not good at planning ahead. This was this was a, this was a misfire, and if anything, I agree that this and the the finale probably actually had some reactionary uh, purpose behind them following Thursday. Yeah. So grading time, uh, Becky um, defeating. It, uh, I'm gonna come out with it, Dan. I'm gonna come out with it. This this gets a fail. I was gonna say this, like I was gonna say this is tough to give like a letter grade because of the fact that it's not really a program at this point, but but the whole segment rating the segment I agree because who, I I might give it a D minus just because of of my nostalgic uh, joy of seeing mm-hmm. Becky come back, but yeah it was still it's a nice pop it's yeah. a nice moment for a SummerSlam but you know. It, like, I don't know if they had Ultimate Warrior in mind when they did this. Like, when he came back and beat Honky Tonk Man in, like, 10 seconds for the IC Championship. I don't know if, like, that was their, like, well, it worked before, it'll, it'll work again. But in context, yeah. not not when you just do it just to do it. So, yeah. anyway, we move on to the next match on the card. We have Drew McIntyre, otherwise known as Drew McIntyre, defeating Jinder Mahal... Uh, in four minutes and forty seconds, the commish comments. Uh, Drew dominating against Jinder. Was this match even needed? I feel like this is a rivalry meant for earlier in the show, since Drew is out of the main event card for now. I will quickly throw this in there. I think this was just an excuse to have Drew on the card because Probably. Drew is a main event pillar. People still like Drew. Yeah, he's he's still a great character. Like everything, like fits. It's just since and especially when you put that um, stipulation that if he lost to Bobby, no more championship matches for Drew. Uh, yeah. As long as Bobby's champion, so it's like now he needs something to juggle until Lashley loses the title and then he can go on another conquest. Yeah. Now Veer and Shanky. I don't like. I don't. I don't care about them. They're just more... They're just the Singh brothers again. They're just beefier Singh brothers. Yeah. Let Jinder stand on his own. I would be... I would care more about this if it was just Drew and Jinder. Because there's already a story with them. The 3MB, the yeah. getting fired, the coming back, and yeah. becoming champion. I don't need toadies. I don't need them. And I don't think it does either of them any favors. And I do think that this was kind of a waste of a match. Yeah. Um, some of these matches are relatively short if you really look at it. Like yeah, and and furthermore, what is going on with the sword? Like, why are we swinging the sword at people? We shouldn't be doing that. I don't believe that Drew's gonna decapitate Shanky. I just don't need to see it. I just don't need to see that. see him swinging a sword at people. Because I know they're heading into Extreme Rules, which is supposed to be the most extreme pay per view of I the year. Swear to God. If Drew hits a chair that somebody's holding with that stupid sword at Extreme Rules... Referee stoppage. I will lose my mind. Don't. <laughs> Don't do that. It's not necessary, and you're you're being weird. WWE, you're, you're doing weird stuff. You're like the weird uncle. I'm not going to finish that. Stop doing it. Um... So, great system. Drew uh, versus gender. I, I would say in an ideal world it would be a B. In reality, I'm going to give it a C-. minus. Yeah, I'll give it a D because, again, I truly believe that this was just there so that Drew can have a match. Yeah. Moving on to... Uh, yeah, you're excited about this one, I can tell. You go ahead. Woo! Dan, don't. That's the end of the episode. Thank you for joining us. Charlotte Flair. <laughs> Blonde Cena. Having just lost the Raw Women's Championship. Being cashed in on three weeks prior. Uh, by Nikki Cash. That didn't work. 
Um, A-S-H. Yeah, Nikki, A-S-H. Uh, and then, ugh, I lost my train of thought here. Point is, Charlotte loses the title after the cash, and Nikki gets one ter- uh, one t- ch- shot to defend the, the title, and she loses it during a triple threat match, taking the fall, I believe. Yes. Um, to Charlotte Flair. So Charlotte loses it, and then regains it like uh, three weeks three later. Three weeks later, because we're just driving full speed ahead toward the sixteen women's titles. Um, and she had made Rhea tap out twice before, so I don't think they wanted to beat that dead horse anymore. So yeah. they just had her tap out. The and champion. I skipped over the fact that Rhea is even in this match because she didn't. She she didn't need to be. Like, if you were gonna have Charlotte go over Nikki anyway, what was the point? What was the point? I didn't go into this match thinking Rhea genuinely had a shot to win win the title, and I was really hoping that Nikki, Nikki was going to retain. Yes, but again, we waste stuff, and now we got Rhea and Nikki sort of making a, a kind of cute, charming tag team. tag team. But nobody wants that because guess what happens? Guess guess what just happened by doing that? You completely bled your women's division dry. You don't have you have bliss, which is what we what we alluded to earlier. Charlotte comes out to uh, brag about her twelfth her twelfth title, and out comes Alexa Bliss and says, "Lily and I just wanted to say hi." Great, great. Now go backstage and sit down. They're putting the title, aren't they? <laughs> so anyway, let's go to the commish. Let's. And once again, Sean suffers the disappointment of Charlotte Flair claiming her 12th women's championship, pushing him to give up on the women's division altogether. But did we need to have Charlotte win for a 12th time? Was it necessary for Charlotte to squash Nikki's dream at the hottest event of the summer? Or would it have been better to let Nikki retain and square off against a nemesis in Alexa Bliss and Lily? Right there. That the story we're doing right now with Charlotte would have been better if you'd done it with Nikki. Nikki, almost a superhero. What is the point of that gimmick if you're not going to ultimately pay that off either? Well, the beautiful part is that you could have gone back to when they were a tag team. And it's like, look at how you have two tag team partners. One who embraced the dark side. One who embraced the bright side. Exactly. And it's the perfect marriage. And hell... Maybe you just use Nikki almost a superhero as a way to break Alexa out of this nonsense that we're growing tired of. There you go. And I would, I, I would say maybe that's still coming, but I don't think it is. I don't think that they well, have even considered what's, what's, what's that. What's the, I mean, Nikki is already he, she's squashed. Yeah, yeah, she, she's not a main eventer because they they not because they she can't be. Yeah. Um, my sentiments, right after the match, I was like, okay, like, w- were, we, were we expecting anything different? <laughs> because at this point, honestly, I feel like for every WrestleMania and every SummerSlam, this is the same story that we're going to get until we hit 16, 17 cha- women's championships for Charlotte. Yeah. Yeah, it sucks because I, I, I meant it when I said it. Rhea has already lost to Charlotte on multiple occasions. So there you go. Nikki, who just got off the ground running, is already squashed. Yeah. And you have Little Miss, I don't want to be anything like my father up in here, taking the spotlight away for a 12th time. Beautiful. And I, that's the funny thing, too, is when someone beats Charlotte for the title, I'm like, okay, someone get a timer going because how much time until she gets it back? I'm serious. I mean, three weeks. Anyway. Time for the grading system. Uh, I'm going to give this a D. I'm like, Rhea is a great character. She's a great performer. Nikki, she's a, she has a great character. She's a great performer. Sure. Um, you know, so like that's what's kind of salvageable out of this whole thing. But again, kind of like with Bianca, you were building somebody who was fresh, who had a new gimmick. I heard that Nikki apparently pitched the whole gimmick herself, was like, I have this idea of almost a superhero, and it's like the second when somebody has a fresh, bright idea, you squander it. Yeah. 
So I'm giving it, it a D. It was definitely wasteful. I'll uh, I'll I'll will go with that. That's that's fine. Um, disappointment. Very much so. Um, we move on to our next match, and I believe the only match that is somewhat kind of salvageable. I truly feel like these two could have taken it a few notches higher if they really wanted to. I don't know if maybe Edge's neck was kind of a restrictor for that, but we have. Edge defeating Seth Rollins by a unique submission move um, in 21 minutes. Your uh, second, longest, second match. longest match of the night. Edge versus Seth could have gone either way for me, if we're being honest. This is the commish speaking. Throwing it back to the vintage Edge or the brood days was one thing, but if we went even further back to his loner days when he first made his debut... At SummerSlam 98 with Sable against Mark Miro and Jacqueline, maybe that would have brought it full circle for Edge. But, as for the match, it doesn't matter who won this, both are amazing athletes. I concur with that assessment. I I, I, I pretty much knew that Edge was going to wind up winning this one. Um... And yeah, there was a nice tie-in where they said this goes seven years back when you had your boot at the back of my yeah. neck and you were about to curb stomp me. So I can appreciate that aspect of it. I thought that some of Edge's promos were actually very good, especially when you had like the close, the choker shot and you would be all up in the camera cutting a promo. Seth, you know, being the martyr, you know, being the, the higher power and, you know trying to bring out the better in everybody or so he thinks. Mm-hmm. I, I thought this feud was fine. They pulled out some nostalgic stuff like the the, the, the blood, the, the the black goo being dropped on Seth and Edge making the brood entrance at SummerSlam. So yeah. um, I thought this was fine. It, it wasn't what both performers could do at their peak. It, it seemed like it was one or two notches down. But overall, this was the most salvageable thing of the entire night. I agree. And the the fact that both of these guys are so sound on pretty much any given day. Yeah. And this one had again that man the the magic that comes with telling something that has a backstory. Like th- this had a story. And that's what made it so good is that you had that heart at the core of it. Yeah. And we're just missing that from pretty much everything else on this card. But no, this was your feel-good moment of the night because if yes. you look at everybody else who won, uh, that's the only bright spot. Like yeah. Edge gets his comeuppance, uh, or sorry, Seth gets his comeuppance with Edge picking up the win, um, and and then you close out the night with um, nonsense. <laughs> so. Well, uh, let's grade it. Edge versus Seth. I'm going to give it a solid A-. minus. Yeah. Again, two very reliable performers did everything that they could possibly do within the realm of this era. Um, and again, most, uh, most salvageable match, segment, spot of the night. Um, moving on to our second to last match, we have the... Uh, the champion walking into the event, the almighty Bobby... Wah, wah. against Goldberg and Goldberg uh, Lashley defeats Goldberg via referee stoppage to retain the WWE championship a seven minute match let's move to the commission's notes and I will take it from there Bobby versus Goldberg ending via stoppage who's being saved here Goldberg or Lashley whose reputation was just damaged because of this horrible decision I'm going to jump in very, very quick. We all thought this was going to be the squash match. We all thought this was spear versus spear, and we were going to get 30 spears from each respective competitor. This match was actually going well because they were actually doing moves. Yeah. Some of it looked a little eh, and God bless Goldberg. You know, he's a little up on age, but he looks phenomenal. But I thought these two were doing exactly what they would have done, say, back in 97 if Goldberg was in his prime. They were doing moves and they were actually trying to go somewhere. And again, much like WWE in typical form, the second you have something solid going, you find a way to just squash it and to like for it, like it crashes and burns quick. 
referee stoppage. I don't know if this is becoming like a thing now where it's like first it was hell in a cell, now it's this. Well, I'm sure that they're steering into the believability side of uh, the sports portion of this. Because you go to UFC, you go to cage fighting, and if somebody cannot continue fighting, you ref stop. stoppage. Yeah. But to kind of throw it back, I for, I already forgot who said it, but somebody said maybe that the Bray, if he goes to, this, this will be relevant, if Bray goes to AEW, he should, like, they shouldn't even touch the... Fiend character, the supernatural stuff, because they don't think it fits in a- AEW, which is valid. The like super over the top stuff, but like WWE is such a polar opposite of that that like they should stay away from the realism. <laughs> like don't don't give me ref stoppages. Just have your guys finish the match. Have Bobby. Have Bobby. Put him in the hurt lock and call it. I don't care. Barry Goldberg, if you're trying to build Bill Bobby. Goldberg is, for all intents and purposes, he's untouchable, but he's got the excuse of being old. You can get away with having Bobby crush him. Yeah. And Bobby benefits, and Goldberg stays the same. That's the only benefit of these part-timers, is that nothing's going to hurt them. There's a reason you pull Goldberg and Cena and Undertaker Lesnar and Lesnar in because it doesn't matter it doesn't matter Drew McIntyre could have claim could have claymored Brock at Wrestlemania and pinned him immediately and it would not have mattered Brock would still be the beast yeah if you're gonna bring these guys in use them as a stepping stone yeah which I think for a solid two minutes they were because yeah. like I said they were doing moves and it wasn't straight out of the gate finisher 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 fest um, and you're right you know what the second when Goldberg is injured and he can't go you have Lashley go screw it puts on the hurt lock Goldberg pa- he doesn't have to tap out he passes out yeah. boom end of story we're done I defeated you, you're done, you're out of the way, now we move on to the next thing. And it becomes a credible thing to put on his resume. I have a victory over Goldberg. Then they bring in his son. Who... Well, I, I want to go back for one second. What, what pissed me off about that first portion is that Bobby just brutalizes Goldberg. And then he stands there as the referee stops the match and looks surprised. What? You're going to look at the guy you just rammed into the ring post three times. I thought that was stupid, but go on. Yeah, we bring in Gage. Yeah, who takes the hurt lock. And there's this weird exchange of MVP grabs the mic and tries to save the whole thing. That could have been anybody. We didn't know it was Goldberg's son. But still, you're WWE champion. Which, that was was a useless promo. Yeah. Could have very easily adjust. Done without oh, it. Oh, oh, that's your show moment. Yeah. Oh God. Uh, get out of the ring. Out. Get out of the ring. And yeah. then you tell it tomorrow. Yeah. You tell it on. Uh, yeah, the, two days on, after. They're, they're on Raw. Yeah. But you tell it on 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 Raw. Yeah. Which they did. They doubled down. They went. Oh, we didn't. Da, 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 but. We beat his ass. <laughs> um, yeah. It was. It was poorly. Poorly executed. Yeah. It was good. It started off good. It was it was a shocker, honestly, yeah. because we're so used to finish your finish your finish your pinfall. Which um, that just on that note, I think they need to get away from. Well, they did for two minutes, and then we. I mean, they need they need to stop going. Yeah, we'll just do, do. in general. Yeah. I like I don't want to get to the next pay per view, and we have these two fight again, and Goldberg hits him with a spear and wins the title. I don't like don't don't do that. If you're going to put on a match, put on a match. Yeah. Put on a match. Which they shockingly attempted to do, but then you squander it. Yeah. So, uh, rating time. Lashley versus Goldberg. I will give it a C because, like I said, they tried to put on a match, but then the booking committee felt like, okay, squash it. I'll agree. I'll give, I'll give the program a C. 
Which, uh, again, I'm going to throw in there. If everything went the same way, but Bobby at the last minute was like, screw it. Put on the hurt lock and lash and Goldberg tapped out. Beautiful. That would have been everything that it needed to be. I would have given it a solid A minus and we could have gone from there. Yeah. But speaking of C, you can't see this next match enough. Uh, Roman Reigns versus John Cena. Roman Reigns picks up the win via pinfall. Um, In the longest match of the night, a flat 23 minutes. Singles match for the Universal Championship. Reigns retains. Had Reigns lost, he would have left the WWE. Which was their biggest indicator. The second when Roman said that, I'm like, okay. Then it's not happening. Uh, Roman versus Cena. Roman's time to continue his reign as the head of the table. I get it. No problem. Him carrying on this ego of his as all shall acknowledge me. Blah, blah, blah. It's starting to get, starting to get tiresome. The alpha male of our species has returned. Pat McAfee never changed, sir. Him delivering that line was awesome. I'm seeing a lot of people are angry at this guy's return, but the war-ready Viking looks ready to do battle. The question remains, was this done in order to compete with CM Punk's debut in AEW? Wait a second, the Viking Raiders weren't on the card. Yeah, well, how weird. So anyway, <laughs> obviously that's alluding to the return of... Uh, Barack Lesnar. I don't like the hair. Me neither. Okay. Um, I know the foot- like photos of him came up with, with that. Yeah. I don't totally know, no. like... Maybe they just were like, hey, Brock, can you shave? And he went, no. And they went, okay, that's fine. <laughs> that's probably more likely what happened. Is they were like, can we do it without? And he went, no. Or, shit, maybe this is another marketing opportunity. We're going to get Brock Lesnar with the man bun uh, action figure. DLC, uh, pre-order 2K22. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, so, here we are. Here um, we are. So, Roman, Roman after a hard-fought match. It's a, it's a decent match. Can we talk about this for just one second? Maybe. What are you talking about? Um, ever since Roman turned heel, there's this ongoing thing where his matches are just slow. Yeah. Like, he'll do a clothesline, and Cena's down for like five minutes, <laughs> and he's walking around the ring, looking into the camera, he's gonna acknowledge me now. Cena gets up, he's about to do something, clothesline, oh, he's down for another ten minutes. <laughs> I don't know if this is like a deliberate thing where they're like, Roman, for the sake of your character, slow down your matches. Because it happens each and every single time that he fights on paper. It's possible, because I think faster-paced matches faster-paced matches tend to skew more heavily toward faces. And so if you have Roman out there and he's got high intensity and he's he's putting on a putting on a clinic then it's hard to want to boo him, um, which is why you slow it down. And then you have those moments where Cena hits the five the five moves of doom, and you go, oh, maybe he's going to get it, because then you're like, oh, this fast sequence of offense coming out of the face. It works better for a face, because you put them, you put them against the wall, and then they've got to battle their way out, yeah. and then you have that moment. But It's just with Roman, it's... Very slow. Well, it's one of those things where they have to find a medium, and we know we exactly know they're bad which at which it. they don't do a good um, job of doing. But I, I mean, I agree. The I, 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 I was kind of like that's a bit, that's a little dramatic path. But at, we get to the end of the match. Roman and puts on his his lay, and he's standing there over. Uh, he's standing there in the ring because Cena's over here, I guess, and. Uh, Brock Lesnar's theme hits, and out he comes with his little. I whatever. literally called it like his little doc four seconds mind. before his theme, and I was like, "Now what if Brock Lesnar comes out?" <laughs> I can't, I can't simulate yeah. the noise. But but just, then the, the story turned over to Paul Heyman. Yeah, where you see the look on his face, like, "Uh oh, like there's I'm the original." In, I'm in trouble. Um, which I don't know if now we're gonna get like a. Brock versus Punk type of deal where they did at SummerSlam where Paul is like in the center of the whole thing. Which, um, which they, they might. 
But, but here's I think the problem. The, the, the thing they need to do is they need to keep Lesnar and Paul separated. Like, they need to... Ha- they, they can't do... I don't know if you saw, saw the, the post, but uh, one of the pages I follow posted a throwback to the Test versus Scott Steiner match for Stacy Keebler's services. <laughs> yeah. Um, they need to stay away from that. Yeah. Like, if anything, you should just have Brock... Brock have a little resentment that Paul was looking for the next cash cow. He goes, look, I don't need you. Brock's not a terrible promo deliverer. He's yeah. not... He's not the worst that yeah. I've ever seen. Did did it benefit him to have Paul, especially as a heel, so that he could just stand there and do what we used to say Roman needed to do for the Shield and just be stoic and stoic and yeah, yeah. strong, silent type. But now Brock is the face, kind of like when he feuded, eh, kind of like when he feuded with uh, with Kurt Angle. Now I I'm not expecting to see a buddy buddy sit down at the table drinking milk together type of feud between these two. But, uh, you should have Brock touch on his resentment for Paul, and then move on and say, "Look, I'm here. I'm here to prove to the whole world that you made a mistake. Yeah. You bet on the wrong, the wrong horse. And you, Roman, you need to remember your place. Like the alpha male of our species. Brock needs to come in and he needs to assert that he is the head of the table like he has been for so long. Yeah. And this is this is Roman proving that no, I it's my time. I've taken this now. That needs to be the core of the story. And you're right. The matches need to be better. I don't want to see another 4F5 three spear Superman punch type of match. One thing that I want to touch on was this victory was not so convincing because John Cena was the originator of I will take five finishers and I will kick out. Yeah. This match, he got hit with one Superman punch and one spear and we called it a day. Yeah, he got hit by a few Superman punches. There were a few. Um, I the spears. I want, to, I want to say there was at least two spears too, though. But um, it just it wasn't convincing fashion. Well, especially after he said, "This man right here knows how much punishment I can take." Exactly. Yeah. And then you and then you bring out the guy who hit him with five f fives and thirty seven su- uh, German suplexes. Yeah. Definitely draws a weird parallel, saying, oh, "Well, maybe John's getting soft." Yeah. Unless maybe that's the subtext of what we're gonna go with. They're gonna go with John. John's been out of the game a minute. I don't know. But when Lesnar came out, again, I was like, okay, maybe once again this is, like, counteracting the whole CM Punk thing. Yeah. But my instant reaction was, oh, great, someone has just returned who's established, who's a part-timer, and is now going to take a spot away from one of the full-timers trying to make a name for themselves. Yeah. So... Again, it's like you look at half the card at SummerSlam, it's part-timers. And you look at the direction that we're going in with, you know, Lashley attacking Goldberg's son and now with Brock Lesnar coming back, insinuating that he's going to face Roman. It's like, once again, it's full-timer versus part-timer, which is not benefiting more than half the roster who say, hashtag push Cesaro is trying to get a push. (laughs) Um... I forgot about Cesaro, for being entirely honest. Where the hell is he at? So maybe he, like, he, he, he should have, that's the problem. Once you move towards, towards the big, the big events, they panic. And they go with these big things where they're like, we need Goldberg, we need Cena, we need Lesnar. Cesaro had a shot at Roman, and then we moved on, and I don't know why. Yeah. That's not even the point, because he's not on the card this time. But, speaking of, I didn't even realize this, neither is Kevin Owens, neither is Sami Zayn. Yeah. People who have been, week after week, putting in the work. Got to see, well, no, I guess you didn't. I was going to say, you got to see Kevin Owens and Sami on Raw, but I don't even know if you actually did. I know that there, I know there was something with Logan Logan Paul, but I think that was with that was Miz and Morrison. Um, Ooh, but I don't care about that breakup if we're being honest. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. More Morrison apparently going to be turned into a into a full blown face though. So beautiful. Um, 
rating system rating for this system match. B. I don't think it was the best, but I think it, yeah. What did we give? What did we give? Seth and Edge. Uh, a minus. Uh, B minus. C minus. C minus. Okay. C minus. Yeah. It was weak. I agree. Yeah. Um, I I'm I am intrigued of how we're gonna start, which I guess we'll see in a couple days, how we're going to start this new, new section season. off. Yeah. But it better be good, let me tell you. I'd, I'm not holding my breath, if we're being completely honest. So anyway, let's bring it home for final thoughts. Kamish leads it off with, I watched SummerSlam, and this is what it comes down to. It was a bad show. In regards to storytelling, booking, and overall quality. Maybe this is why John Cena decided to go back to Hollywood. Everything went down as one could predict. So, it was a very... Blase show. You could you could probably... Like, you could probably look at the card and just kind of guess. Like, what? Yeah. I think I think for the most part, you if you just go with your gut, looking at each of these, you could probably pick the winner. Maybe Sands the Raw Women's Title match. But even even like if you just showed me, with no preconceived notions, if you just showed me Becky Lynch versus Bianca with Becky as the as the fill in, and you didn't tell me she turned heel, you didn't tell me any of that. I still would probably be like, oh, Becky might win. It was very like it was very generically predictable. Yeah. Based on who's in these matches and who they've committed time to. Especially when you have Roman come out the go home show before and say, "If I don't win, I am walking out of WWE." Yeah. Which for a solid second, I was like, I was flirting with the idea of him possibly going to an NXT. Yeah. C- pulling a Finn Balor and being like, okay, well, I've served my time on the main roster. Why not go to NXT, get a few eyeballs there, work a few programs, and maybe come back? It would it would do nothing but favors for NXT. And then Cena maybe takes the torch, and then Big E cashes in, and there is a little bit of history there. Because you know? they're homies, yeah. Yeah. So, but then again, maybe I'm giving you a good idea, and that's not what we're looking for. Um, overall, this was very disappointing. I told you off air, I was trying very hard to go to this event live and after it was done, actually not even somewhere around here after the women's raw women's title match without even knowing what was going to happen in your three main events. I was like, yeah, you know what? I'm glad I didn't go. Yeah. Because it it was just stale. It would have felt like a a waste of time. A waste of time, money, energy, and... So, yeah, no, not one of the better Summer Slams, if we're being honest. Yeah, I'll I'll agree. The overall uh, show, somewhere in the D range. Yeah. Not not nothing impressive here. Yeah. So, and again, when you have a CM Punk and a potential Daniel Bryan on the way to AEW, it's about that time that you get your stuff together. Which, judging by this pay per view, you thought that bringing back Becky and having her squash your current champion and bring in Brock back to revisit Roman for the 80th time was going to counteract that. I'm sorry, but you like that shallow thinking, Yeah, you know? Yeah. You got a great pop twice in one night, but after the pop, it, it's, it's like doing drugs. <laughs> Once the high wears off, where are you? Be so. straight edge. See, I'm pumped. Yeah, so final sentiments? Anything? Nah. No. Uh, do better. Do drop. So there you go, guys. We just reviewed SummerSlam 2021. Let us know what you guys think in the comment section below. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will catch you all. Bye.